War. War never changes. From the moment the narrator says these words, we understand the world we're about to enter is filled with death, plague, and misery. We're tossed into a society that no longer exists. Not since America was plunged into a nuclear fallout after a series of nukes fell across the country in 2077. Almost all of the American population was wiped out, and the only survivors are those sealed within various vaults scattered around the wastelands. The year is now 2277. After living in Vault 101 for 19 years, your father suddenly vanishes, leaving chaos in the vault after his escape. You decide to follow him outside and launch into the open world of Washington, D.C. You're left alone to try and follow in your dad's footsteps to see where he disappeared to and why he decided to leave. But questions remain. Can society still exist after a nuclear fallout? And how can you, as the player, change this world around you? Upon leaving the vault, I hiked southeast and came across a town called Megaton. I was surprised to find that it is an actual town, or as much as a town can be, with a bar and shops and homes, all kinds of sorts. Shops have their own unique items that could be bought, sold, or traded. Pre-war money, featuring all of our favorite dead presidents, have been replaced by bottle caps as the main currency, being that soda bottles are now more accessible than paper money. However, even with the notion that this town may still function, the capitalistic vices of how towns and cities survive also live with this functionality. Before the bombs fell, citizens had access to an overabundance of resources at their discretion. Supermarkets, clothing stores, roofs over their heads, all gone with the flash of a nuclear explosion. In Fallout 3, resources are limited. If you clean out a location and return later hoping to gather more supplies, thinking that they may have respawned, you're completely out of luck. This makes resources, no matter what kind they are, essential to your survival. If you run out of stim packs and need a health boost in a cinch, you may need to result to drinking irradiated water in order to heal yourself. Without these resources, you, or members within a set society, are bound to collapse. Because of this, you need to penny pinch every cap you come across and how to spend it wisely. Without caps, there's no chance of survival. You need them to buy and repair weapons, ammo, and armor. You may as well be a moving practice dummy if you don't have a fanny pack full of caps. It's just like how real America works. Money is king. We need to buy food, water, homes, pencils, books, computers, regrettable eBay purchases, everything. In a way, Fallout 3 shows how powerful the dollar, or cap, can be. Even in a post-apocalyptic society, we're driven to do things we do based on the cash we can check in from the task. Even if the choices made aren't the most altruistic, we do it for the money. The brilliance of Fallout's economy isn't just how it survives, but also establishes why capitalism mirrors American capitalism in reality. According to author and professor Eli Cook, America used to view status based on moral statistics, as opposed to just economic standing. This includes literacy, life expectancy, job occupation, so on and so forth. But soon after the Civil War, the now unified country focused on creating a society based on generating profit on anything and everything in order to become a wealthy country again. As Cook explains this newfound capitalism, it is the act through which basic elements of society and life are transformed or capitalized into income-generating assets that are valued and allocated in accordance with their capacity to make money and yield future returns. In the world of Fallout, where even scrap metal has a price, this certainly holds true. The 1960s aesthetic before the bombs fell also signifies that the citizens of Fallout's America used to follow this same formula, especially during the height of anti-communism rallies that mirror the ones that we faced in the 1960s. Money obviously isn't the only matter that drives this game forward, but it does try to sway you to take certain decisions you wouldn't otherwise take. Some decisions you make can heavily impact your experience and can create consequences you may regret later. In order to get the full scope of these choices, we must look beyond the main story and instead focus on three side quests that have incredible power demonstrating these choices. The power of the Atom, Agatha's Son, and Tenpenny Tower hold the most gravita when speaking of the impact of these overall experiences in the game. 
The power of the atom begins with Sheriff Sims of Megaton requesting you disarm the still-active bomb planted in the middle of the town, offering a hundred caps if you complete the job. However, in the town's pub, you come across a shady man named Mr. Burke, who wants you to detonate the bomb on orders from a man named Alistair Tenpenny, because he believes the town is an eyesore. Immediately, my first reaction was, hell no. Why would I kill all of these innocent people? Then he offers me 500 caps. Being as early in the game as it was, 500 caps looked like a good deal. However, in the end, my moral conscience got the best of me, and I ended up notifying the sheriff about Burke and detonating the bomb, and I ended up saving the town. Agatha's song is more personal. It focuses on an old woman named Agatha who wants to broadcast her violin playing throughout the wasteland. The problem is she doesn't have a violin to display her talents. She wants you to extract a violin that used to be owned by her great-great-grandmother's sister. I end up getting the violin, but then I get other offers to turn in the violin for a couple hundred caps. The angel on my shoulder once again whispers to me that I should just hand in the violin, and then I do. Afterward, she ends up being the happiest, sweetest digital old lady imaginable. Finally, we have Tenpenny Tower, which deals with Alistair Tenpenny, the extremely wealthy owner of the tower, refusing to let a pack of ghouls into his apartments. You're suddenly caught between Tenpenny, who's afraid the residents won't consider living with a pack of ghouls, and Roy, the leader of that pack of ghouls who wants to kill all of the residents and take the tower for himself. You're torn between killing everybody in the tower, or Roy and all of his ghouls. However, there's a silver lining that nobody else considers, negotiating with the citizens of Tenpenny to see if they're okay with the ghouls moving in. Most of them are, aside from a few naysayers that end up getting the boot into the wasteland to fight on their own, to allow the ghouls to take their place in the tower. The key drive to what makes these missions and Fallout 3 on a whole unique is how dynamic the results of these missions can be making the world feel truly alive. You're faced with many different dilemmas that result in several different outcomes. In The Power of the Atom, had I not deactivated the bomb, dozens of people would have died. And, in Agatha's song, I would have never heard her songs on the radio had I given the violin away. But the most extreme outcome came several in-game weeks later after finishing Tenpenny Tower, where I returned to find all of the residents killed and thrown in the basement of the tower. It turned out that Roy ended up killing all of the current residents anyway to seize the tower as his own. Seeing this result made me feel so angry that I ended up shooting and killing Roy myself, as if it would avenge the people that are dead because of my own actions. I felt angry at what had happened, not considering that Roy would go to such an extreme after allowing him and his ghouls to live in the tower. Marcus Schulsk says it well in his Game Studies article, Moral Decision Making in Fallout, quote, while players must complete the same main quests, they have so much choice over which side quests to complete, and how to complete them, that no other player can come away with the same experience as another. As stated previously, I could have given away Agatha's violin, and I could have detonated the bomb in Megaton, and I could have killed Roy before he could ever step foot into Tenpenny Tower, but other players have done these things, while I only thought of them. And that's what makes these choices so enlightening, or brutal, depending on which side of the spectrum you're on. Trying to figure out what other people have done makes you reflect on the decisions you could have made, and how they could have been done better. These decisions make you strategize and wonder, making you an active participant in the experience of Fallout's world. So why would we even bother being the good guy in the world of Fallout? If nothing has real-life implications, why don't I just go on a rampage and kill everyone? Why didn't I let Megaton blow up, or sell Agatha's violin away? One of the most fascinating parts of this game didn't come in the form of blowing up a giant enclave base, or cutting through waves of raiders with power armor. Instead, it came in the form of a wastelander dying of thirst, begging for a sip of purified water outside of Megaton. All I had in my inventory was one bottle of purified water, since this was pretty soon after emerging from the vault. I didn't have many other healing items, and I was worried for my own safety as what would happen to me if I gave him what little resources I had. In the end, I gave him the bottle of water. I got nothing in return. No caps, no ammo, no weapons. All I ended up getting was good karma. 
The karma system reflects all of the choices you've made throughout your adventures in the capital wasteland, and can also change on how other wastelanders view you. It can also affect who will go to arms alongside you. At first it doesn't seem to have any impact other than to raise your morality levels, but the longer you play, the more apparent the changes become, especially depending on what outcomes you get on the various quests taken. A week or two after disarming the bomb in Megaton, people started coming up to me with little rewards like food scraps and the occasional Nuka-Cola. Later on, I received free stim packs and ammo from people, telling me how lucky and grateful they were to have somebody like me around to disarm the bomb. Additionally, while listening to Agatha's station, you can occasionally hear her thanking you for retrieving her violin when nobody else would go up with the task. But the ultimate revelation of your actions comes at the end of the game. It's up to you to stop the collapse of Project Purity, a water purifying machine started by your dad to provide pure water for everyone in the capital wasteland. In the end, you're left with the ultimate decision. Going into the purifying chamber to restart the device while enduring high levels of radiation, or sending in Sarah Lyons instead. I ended up moving into the chamber, stabilized the generator, and prevented the collapse, but at the cost of my own life. What followed was a series of stills showing my journey and all of the people that I helped during it. It's a reflection of all the good deeds you've done, and you get to see how you've really impacted the wasteland as a whole. There's a sense of achievement upon completing the game this way, feeling like you've actually done something truly special. But what drove me to complete the game this way? Daniel M. Schaefer, professor of film and digital media at Baylor University, describes this choice making as a form of moral activation, which is an insertion of oneself into decision making based on how you would react in the shoes of someone else. In the case of Fallout 3, your avatar is what you project yourself into. You change the game based on projecting yourself into this person. In my case, I chose to be morally active with my character, choosing what I would have done in real life, treating quest givers as if they were real people. Schaefer explains that, quote, As humans encounter situations of moral choice, then self-regulation is essentially in a neutral position. Various factors, such as individual worth and tendency towards moral disengagement, as well as other individual difference factors, can impact whether self-sanctions against reprehensible conduct are activated or disengaged. To simplify it, projecting yourself based on life experience. The level of engagement can vary from player to player, however. When Schaefer explains that players of violent video games may not be used to these scenarios and have a hard time making immoral decisions, some players will have no difficulty in doing so. There are Fallout players that kill and ravage everyone and everything they come across, letting their bad karma accumulate to the point where they become the scourge of the wasteland. Once again quoting Schaefer, Gamers report greater enjoyment when playing violent video games and do not feel that committing game violence is wrong, but also adds, it stands to reason that gamers' reactions to moral situations in video games would be tied to their own personal sense of morality. So if all you're doing is pillaging and killing in the wastelands, it could signify that there's a reflection tied to your real-world psyche, even if it's an innate desire to create havoc and chaos in an environment where you're free to do so. Even with the recent hate circulating around Fallout and Bethesda Studios, Going back to games with prestige such as this is hard to replicate, even today. Fallout 3 is over a decade old, but it still stands the test of time very well. Its world has a rich economy and society that's oddly reminiscent of our own. It also tests players who enter the capital wasteland with trials that impact the rest of your interactive experience, and makes you question some of your choices afterward by pinning a mirror to your own mind. It's a game that has a lot to say, and being able to explore every corner of the map allows anyone to discover something new. Keep in mind that no matter what you do to survive, just remember, war, war never changes.